Hi, my name is Sam, and today I'll be presenting our paper, Avoiding Disparity Amplification Under Different Worldviews. So since you're at this conference, you're probably well aware of the need for machine learning models to be fair. But even when people agree on the need to be fair, they may disagree on which notion of fairness to use. So one famous example of this is the Compass Recidivism Prediction Algorithm. And the journalists at ProPublica analyzed this model using a standard of fairness called equalized odds or separation and found that this model is biased against black people. And in response, the model creators did their own analysis using a different standard of fairness called predictive parity or sufficiency, and they found that the model is actually fair under this standard. So in this talk, I'm going to present one possible reason why people may disagree on which fairness definition to use. So we're going to motivate worldviews, which are assumptions about how the observed data is biased, if at all. And then we're going to propose criteria for fairness and utility based on the construct, which is what you think the observed data would have been if there was no bias in the observation process. And then we're finally going to show that different worldviews motivate different definitions in fair machine learning. So one reason for this disagreement in which fairness definition to use could be because they disagree on the worldview. So let's get started. In a standard machine learning setting, uh, the observed ground truth is used to train the model, and then the model outputs predictions which hopefully accurately reflect the observed ground truth. So in the predictive policing example from before, setting aside questions of whether such systems should even be used in the first place, the observed ground truth could correspond to how likely a criminal defendant is to be rearrested within a certain number of years. And the prediction could be the bail or sentencing recommendation output by the model. But then the issue is that the ground truth can be biased. In the United States, certain neighborhoods are more heavily policed than others, and these neighborhoods tend to be minority neighborhoods. And there's some evidence that you're more likely to be arrested for the same crime if you're black compared to if you're white. So in response to this, Friedler et al. in 2016 proposed the use of the construct, which is what you think the observed ground truth would have been if it weren't if there was no bias in the observation process. So in this example, it could correspond to reoffense rate, how likely a criminal defendant is to commit a crime again, regardless of whether they're arrested for it. And because Existing definitions in fair ML, uh, most prior work don't really deal with the construct. The existing definitions relate the observed ground truth to the prediction. But as I've said already, the observed ground truth can be biased, so we would like to relate the construct and the prediction to come up with our fairness criteria. But then the problem with this is that the construct is usually not observable. You can't uh, see how many people actually committed a crime when they're not arrested for it. So this is where worldviews come in. So worldviews were also introduced by Friedler et al. And two possible examples of worldviews is the first is we're all equal, which states that every group is identical with respect to the construct. So in other words, the construct Y prime is independent of the protected attribute Z. And here in the previous example, the protected attribute would be race. So another way of saying this is that any disparity in the observed space must be due to a bias in the observation process rather than due to a disparity in the construct. And then another worldview is the WYSIWYG, or what you see is what you get worldview, which says that the observed space accurately reflects the construct space. So the observed value Y equals the construct Y prime. 
So now that we have worldviews, I'm going to introduce our construct-based fairness and utility criteria, which relate the construct to the predictions. But before I do that, we use the total variation distance pretty extensively throughout the paper. So I'm just going to briefly explain what these things are. So the total variation distance is the distance metric between two random variables. And it is defined as one half times the sum over all possible values these random variables could take of the differences in the probabilities for those values. So that was a mouthful. So I'm going to present an example. So suppose we have random variables y0 and y1. If you look at the bottom left, y0 has higher probability of equaling the value 0 compared to the values 2 or 3. And y1, on the other hand, is uniformly distributed over the values 0 through 3. So to compute the total variation distance, we overlap these probability mass functions, and then we see where these things differ. So at the value 0, y0 has a higher probability than y1. So we take the amount of the axis. And at the values 2 and 3, y1 has a higher probability than y0. So we take the amount of the axis there. We add all of these up and then multiply by one half. And the reason why we multiply by one half is so that these distances are between zero and one, but that's not too important for our purposes. So now we're going to present our construct-based uh, fairness and utility criteria. The first definition we use for this is disparity amplification. And this is what we don't want the model to do. So let Z be a binary protected attribute. In the predictive policing example from before, Z equals zero could correspond to the white defendants and Z equals one could correspond to the black defendants. Then a model exhibits disparity amplification if the output disparity of the model, this is the total variation distance between the, the distributions of the outputs of the model for the z equals zero group versus the z equals one group, if this output disparity is greater than the construct disparity, which is a similar quantity defined in terms of the construct rather than the output. And the motivation for this is that an output disparity can be justified by an equally large construct disparity. The goal of the model is to accurately predict the construct. So if there is some construct disparity and the model accurately reflects the, the construct, then it'll also have an equally large output disparity. So an equally large output disparity is justifiable. On the other hand, if the output disparity is in fact greater, then we can't justify that. So it's reasonable to conclude that the model may be amplifying the bias in a discriminatory way. And since we're saying that the model, uh, one of the things we want from this model is to accurately predict the construct, we also define construct optimality which happens when the output of the model and the construct are always equal. And this isn't going to happen in practice, but we use this definition to reason about when uh, a model may be unnecessarily, when the utility of a model may be unnecessarily harmed. And just as a disclaimer, these are not the only possible notions of fairness or utility. There are a lot of different notions of fairness that are not well captured by disparity amplification, but this is the definition we choose to use. So now that we have the worldviews and we introduce the construct-based fairness and utility criteria, we're now going to talk about the existing definitions in fair machine learning. So the existing definitions of fairness connect the two observable spaces, the observed uh, ground truth observations and the predictions. So we can interpret these as empirical tests of fairness. 
And we say that a worldview motivates an empirical test if when assuming the worldview, first we want this uh, empirical test to give a meaningful guarantee of fairness. So uh, the fairness criterion is that the model that satisfies the empirical test is guaranteed to have no disparity amplification. And for the utility criterion, uh, if the construct optimal model doesn't actually satisfy the empirical test, then this means that the empirical test effectively precludes an optimal model. So this suggests that the empirical test may be unnecessarily lowering the utility of the model. So for our utility criterion, we say that every construct optimal model must satisfy the empirical test. So now we're going to present our main results, which show that different worldviews motivate different definitions of fairness. So first, we're going to show that the we are all equal worldview motivates demographic parity. And just as a refresher, a model satisfies demographic parity if the output of the model is statistically independent of the protected attribute Z. So the distribution of the output of the model does not depend on the protected attribute. So first, we're going to prove the fairness aspect of this. So if a model satisfies demographic parity, then we have y hat, the output of the model, is independent of z. And this means that the distribution of y hat given z equals 0 and the distribution of y hat given z equals 1 are identical. So the total variation distance between them is 0. So this quantity must be less than or equal to the construct disparity because the construct disparity is also a total variation distance, which is going to be non-negative. So zero is always less than or equal to some non-negative value. So this means that we have no disparity amplification. If a model satisfies the demographic parity empirical test, then it has no disparity amplification, which is what we wanted to show. But then note that we don't actually use the we're all equal worldview here. So why don't we always enforce demographic parity regardless of the worldview? And the answer is because of utility. So now I'm going to present our proof of the utility aspect of motivation. So if the we're all equal worldview holds, then we have y prime, the construct, is independent of z. So if a model is construct optimal, the construct always equals the output of the model, then the output is also independent of Z, which is exactly our definition of demographic parity. So we've shown that under the we're all equal worldview, every construct optimal model satisfies the demographic parity empirical test, which is what we wanted to show for the utility criterion. But if we modify this proof a little and say that the we're all equal worldview no longer holds, then by very similar reasoning, we have that uh, every construct auto model does not satisfy the demographic parity empirical test. So this suggests that if you keep enforcing the, the demographic parity when the we're all equal worldview does not hold, then you may be unnecessarily lowering the utility of the model. And now we're going to talk about the WYSIWYG worldview. So for equalized odds, which is which says that the output of the model must be independent of the protected attribute given the observed ground truth. So this is similar to demographic parity, but the definition is conditional on the observed ground truth. Then we can show that the WYSIWYG worldview motivates equalized odds. I'm not going to present the proof here, but the proofs are in the paper. And for calibration, the model is slightly different in that it outputs a probability. And a model is calibrated if when the model says that there's a 30% likelihood that a person will reoffend 
the person actually has 30% likelihood of reoffending, and this holds regardless of the person's race. So in this case, we can show that the WYSIWYG worldview almost motivates calibration, but with the modified fairness criterion that uses uh, so the original fairness criterion uses the total variation distance for the output disparity, but now we only have the difference in the expected values. So this still gives us a meaningful guarantee, but this is not as great uh, because, as we'll show, the, this uh, fairness guarantee is not robust to post-processing. So suppose that a model outputs 0 0.6 for five people in the z equals zero group, and it outputs zero for one other person in the z equals zero group. Then the expected output of the model you can compute is one half. And similarly, uh, we have z equals one group here, and you can also compute that the expected output for the z equals one group is also one half. But then the problem with these probabilities is that you can't half arrest a person or you can't half hire a person. So at some point, you need to go from these probabilities to a higher or no higher decision. And the way that's often done is through thresholds. So if you put the threshold at one half, then now we'll have the overwhelming majority of the z equals zero group being hired and the overwhelming majority of the z equals one group being not hired. And this, is, uh, this amplifies the disparity. So this is an evidence because in general, we can't satisfy equalized, equalized odds and calibration at the same time. This is an argument for the use of equalized odds rather than calibration, at least if your goal is to avoid disparity amplification. And finally, we have some other contributions in the paper as well. We show that regardless of worldview, the predictive parity or sufficiency empirical test allows for arbitrarily large output disparity. We introduce worldviews that are hybrids of the Wirral equal and WYSIWYG worldviews. And we generalize to continuous construct using earth movers distance. So thank you for coming to this talk and please read the paper.